if I told you that most of the statistics you're told are manipulating you? Let's explain that. Hey everyone and welcome to Things Explained. There's a saying that figures don't lie, but liars figure. If you look around in the media, you'll see lots of numbers that are technically right, but can still mislead you. You're better than that. After this video, you'll be prepared to free yourself from the hidden agendas around you. I'm going to give you four C's for spotting faulty use of statistics. These are things that I've run across in my PhD research, so you won't have to make the same mistakes. Now I'm not going to get into some of the real low stuff, such as blatantly lying or anything like that. Let's get into it. Number one, comparing two different things. For example, in 2015, there were 3,500 traffic fatalities in the state of Texas. There were only 45 in Rhode Island. That means that Texas drivers are much more dangerous than Rhode Island, right? When you hear it like that, it's pretty obvious that the comparison isn't legitimate. But what if I told you Connecticut had 266, and Oregon had 447? Clearly Oregon drivers are worse, right? I can even hide what I'm doing by telling you that the population and the miles driven in these states are comparable. But there's still some other pretty big disparities in terms of the density and where people are driving. Oregon has four times as many miles traveled that occurs on rural roads compared to Connecticut. Number two is correlation and causation. They're not the same thing. Let's look at one example. Suicide is an important topic in discussions of mental health. A typical first treatment response for individuals who are at risk is prescribing what's called an SSRI. However, in some cases, other types of antidepressants are prescribed. Suicide rates among those who take other drugs are actually higher than those taking SSRIs, which has led to some to call for the stop of prescribing these types of drugs due to this correlation. However, this claim misses one major point. People who take drug A and people who take drug B are not comparable to each other. The statistics allow us to measure that taking drug B is correlated with a higher suicide rate, but the data also supports the explanation that patients with a higher risk of suicide are more likely to be prescribed drug B, so the drug may actually be better than A. There's a lot more to the story than just looking at two numbers. Correlations are important and should be watched, but there are plenty of possible explanations. In other news, did you know that the passage of time and the number of pirate ship boardings are correlated? That means that if we want to go back in time, we just have to increase the number of pirate boardings, right? Number three is cherry picking data. Let's look at some of the data on global temperature by year. If we look at the last 10 years or so, the data looks something like this. There's a lot of variation between years, but if we just look at these years, it appears that there's no overall change in temperature outside the normal fluctuations. The average person wouldn't be alarmed by how I'm showing the data, but in reality, looking at 10 years of data is bad practice in climatology, precisely due to the variability from year to year. If we extend our scope to include a more standard 25 to 30 years, we start to see a general trend that the global temperatures have, on average, increased over time. Of course, a smaller data set conveniently started at a really hot year to make sure it shifted the trend. Cherry picking data is often used to gerrymander biased data in a way that looks fair, but it can even lead to finding something that looks significant just by random chance. Typically, we say that if a test will only give a false positive 5% of the time, it is statistically significant. So be suspicious if someone presents you with data showing that one flavor in a pack of 20 jelly bean flavors cures cancer. Number four is count. Okay guys, I did it. I really wanted to say sample size, but it doesn't start with C. Don't hurt me. The whole premise behind statistics is using probabilities to quantify how likely a result is due to chance. If you flip a coin once and it lands on heads, you can't say that the coin is loaded. If it lands on heads again, you still can't say that it's loaded. If it happens again and again and again and again, then you start to become suspicious. Of course, there's no magic number where you suddenly know that it's loaded, but with each consecutive head, the results get more and more convincing. Now expand this to whether people support one candidate or the other. How many people do you really need to survey to get a good estimate? Surprisingly, you can get a pretty good estimate for a population of millions with just a few hundred responses. However, even with a huge sample, the sample can only represent the population from which the sample originates. In other words, a politician's internal polls won't be accurate for a general election if only his supporters are polled. That should be obvious, but it seems that this comes up every election, and people are always surprised. So there you have it. Did I miss anything? Have you fallen victim to any of these? Leave a comment below. If you like what you saw, check out my most recent video here, and if you want to be notified every Thursday when I release a new video, click here to subscribe. And don't forget to share with anyone who may need a reminder of these things.